Heavenly Father, we come before you and we thank you again for uh, your amazing grace in our lives. Uh, Lord, we all deserve uh, to be separated from you for eternity, but we thank you for your uh, powerful uh, hand upon our lives, Lord, your sovereign grace, uh, your, your mercy, your love. Lord, will you uh, open up our eyes to see our need for the Savior Jesus? And we thank you, Lord, that uh, we just simply put our faith and trust in you alone for our salvation, and you saved us. It didn't matter what we did. It didn't matter our background. Lord, it all, all that mattered was that we would surrender to you because uh, you did everything for our salvation, and we give you all the glory. And Father, we pray for uh, our state, our nation, as we enter this election season. We just pray that you would uh, stir us up. Lord, help us not to sit on the sidelines and expect somebody else to vote, but we thank you that we have that right to vote in our nation, and, and I know we will be held accountable by you how we uh, use that vote. And so I pray, Father, that you would stir us up and that we would see uh, how we can make a difference even in this uh, situation because everything uh, we face, it's not a battle against flesh and blood. As much as we look at the people in D.C. And, and get upset, Lord, we know it is a spiritual battle. And so we just pray that we would um, be vessels of honor for your glory. And Father, we ask that you would be with Emily right now as he is uh, still traveling on his way to um, northeast India. We pray that you would give him traveling mercies. I'm sure he's probably stuck in the airport there in Delhi for 10 hours. So uh, bless his time, give him the rest he needs, and use him as a vessel of honor, again, for the glory, for your uh, kingdom, for your righteousness' sake. And Father, we pray that uh, you'd give us ears to hear what your Spirit is saying to us as we go through uh, the book of Acts. What a glorious book you've given us uh, from Genesis to Revelation. May we always uh, study to show ourselves approved, uh, men and women who are not ashamed of your word, and help us to rightly divide the word of truth. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So turn with me to Acts chapter 9 uh, as we continue our study through the book of Acts. I haven't told a bad joke in a while. That's because I haven't told a joke in a while, <laughs> uh, but I heard about this uh, really old church, and they lost their bell ringer, and so he uh, was retired, and so uh, they hired a new guy to ring the bell, and so one of the elders took him up on this steep roof of the church to have him ring the bell, and as he got ready to ring it, uh, the new guy tripped, and he fell, and he face-planted right into the bell, and it made a loud gong. And it knocked him unconscious, and he falls off the roof, lands at the feet of these other two elders that are watching the whole thing. And they look at one another, and they said, do you know this guy? And he goes, I don't, but his face sure rings a bell. <laughs> Told you it was dumb. Some of you are still wondering, what? Anyway, the bells must have been ringing throughout Damascus, so, you know, not literally, but uh, even probably all the way to Jerusalem with the salvation, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Last week we saw that in an instant he goes from being a ravenous beast who, would, uh, who is destroying followers of Christ to becoming a believer and a follower of Christ, and he would become one of the greatest witnesses for Jesus of all time. He wrote probably about uh, half the New Testament. Now, when Saul of Tarsus met Jesus on the road to Damascus, as we saw in the first part of chapter 9, uh, he had a decision to make. Would he keep fighting against the Lord, or would he finally surrender to the Lord? And as far as Saul was concerned, uh, it was a no-brainer because he now knows for sure Jesus is alive. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. And so he, he couldn't deny the fact that Jesus was alive, risen from the dead. The gospel's actually true. Jesus died for our sins upon the cross. He conquered death by rising up from the grave. That's what all the, the disciples were sharing. And Paul thought they were liars until he met Jesus for himself. And he realizes mankind can be forgiven of all sin. All we need to do is put our faith and trust in Christ alone. And so when Saul heard the voice of Jesus, he chose immediately to surrender to the Lord. And that's what he said, you know, Lord, what do you want me to do? And at that moment, he becomes born again and he begins to follow Christ. 
and he would never be the same. Everything in his life was different. He went from being a self-righteous sinner who thought he could save himself by his own efforts to becoming totally dependent upon Christ, the only righteous one. He went from being a preacher of God's law to now being a preacher of God's grace and mercy. In short, Saul was truly a new creation in Christ. He would later write, uh, behold, all things are new. You know, all things have passed away. The old things, my whole uh, brutal life is now gone because now I'm a new creation in Christ. And so his heart has been changed. His mind has been changed. His very countenance was changed. He went from being this angry, vicious man to being a man after God's own heart. Uh, he went from opposing Christ uh, to receiving Christ to living for Christ to then proclaiming Christ. And as we'll see throughout the book of Acts, he will be uh, living for Christ and proclaiming the good news to anybody and everybody who would listen. And oftentimes it got him into very big trouble. He was uh, counting the cost because he knew this would cost him his life at some point. And around the age of 70, he would be arrested a second time and be put to death outside of Rome by having his head chopped off. But it didn't matter to Paul. He knew Jesus was the only source of salvation. And so with that same zeal and determination that was in him to destroy the followers of Jesus, now he uses that same determination, that same zeal to now preach in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so after Ananias came to him, we saw that he laid hands on him. Something like scales falls from his eyes. He's filled with the Spirit and he regains his sight and so now he's not content just to have Jesus for himself. He's not content just to have his fire insurance, you might say, but he wanted to make a difference. He wanted to be used by the Lord. And, and, and a sub-theme of this whole section is uh, how God can use one person to change lives. So God can use one person to make a big difference in people's lives. And so keep that in mind because God wants to use each one of us here to make a big difference in other people uh, around us, wherever we are. Look at verse 20 of chapter 9. This is where we pick up. He uh, receives a sight. He's strengthened. He spent some time there in Damascus with the disciples. And then immediately he preached the Christ, the Messiah, in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. And this would be Saul's, and then the later the Apostle Paul, this would be his outline throughout his life. He would, first of all, even though Jesus has called him to be the Apostle to the Gentiles, he had such a burden, such a heart for his fellow Jews. He would always seek out a synagogue first and proclaim the gospel to them. I mean, he's the one that wrote in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and his salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles, the Greeks. And so he was always looking for his fellow Jews. He, he, he'll say in Romans 10.1, my prayer to God and heart's desires for the Jews to be saved. I mean, he, he, was, he knew. I mean, he was a, a Jew of Jews. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin. He knew the law probably better than almost anybody in Israel, and yet he knew it was not going to get him saved or get him to heaven. So now he wants to see his fellow, fellow Jews come to Christ. So he'd go to the synagogue. He would show from the Old Testament scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. And again, he was a Pharisee. And because he was a Pharisee, he was allowed to go into synagogues. You know, any traveling Pharisee could go be invited and they could speak. And so he used that opportunity as long as he could to go in and tell the Jews about their Messiah, Yeshua, Jesus. And so he took advantage of that for as long as he could. And, and, and nobody had the mastery of the Old Testament like Saul did. Uh, again, he knew Genesis to Malachi inside and out. And now that he's got Jesus in his life, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the key that unlocks the whole Old Testament to know and see Jesus throughout the Old Testament. And so that's what he would do. That was his pattern. Find a synagogue, witness to the Jewish people. Look at verse 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? Uh, again, they knew who Saul was. They knew he had destroyed families. He'd locked people up for believing in Jesus. His fellow Jews that he thought were following a false dead prophet named Jesus. He had him arrested. He even said he had some put to death. That's how zealous he was for the law. 
And so now, you know, these the people know. Everybody knew Saul of Tarsus. They dreaded him. And so they say, and hey, he's come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. Verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. And so again, the, the Jews were just blown away by Saul of Tarsus. They couldn't understand what has happened to him. Well, Jesus happened to him. The Holy Spirit has happened to him. He's a new creation in Christ. You know, he, he knows the Lord. He sees and hears Jesus working in his life. And so he's radically saved and he wants to do the same with other people. He wants to see his fellow Jews radically saved. He wants to see that in all of us. Jesus wants you radically saved. If you don't know him, he wants you to get born again. Jesus said, unless you're born again, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven. You can't get to heaven on your own good works, your own efforts. You don't earn heaven. You don't buy your way into heaven. You need to humble yourself and come to Christ. And so the Jewish authorities, they're very upset with him. Look at verse 23. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. And we'll see that little phrase, kill him, uh, a couple times more uh, in, you know, dealing with Paul. But here we see the tables are turned because Paul goes from being the Jewish zealot who was hunting down Christians to being a Christian who is now being hunted down by zealous Jews. And so the tables have definitely turned to the, the religious leaders. Paul is a traitor. That's why they want to put him to death. Verse 24, but their plot became known to Saul and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Again, we see they want to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and let him down through the wall in a basket. So you talk about being humbled. I mean, he's first humbled when he comes into Damascus. Remember, he's blinded by the glory of the Lord. He doesn't see for three days. And now he's being humbled, being lowered out of a basket. But he was no basket case. Uh, he was being let out so that he could continue his growth in the Lord, his ministry in the Lord. God had his hand in this all along. It was all a part of the process uh, of taking this man who was so very self-righteous, so arrogant, so full of himself, and he humbles him so that he could be an instrument in God's hand that God could now use. You know, I think there comes a point in every one of our lives, um, if you want to be used by the Lord, then you need to be humbled. You need to come to a place where you put aside all self-righteousness, you put aside all uh, arrogance, and you need to be broken, and you realize that Jesus cannot use us if we're puffed up and arrogant. But when we humble ourselves before him, we become a vessel of honor in his hands. And so all of us need to go through that season of preparation. And that's what we see with Saul of Tarsus. Now, between verse 25 and verse 26, we actually have a three-year gap. Luke doesn't put it in here, but we'll see it in a moment. And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, so again, from Damascus to Jerusalem would take three years, um, it, it didn't take him that long to get there, but he's got another direction to go first. So when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. And, and so again, Paul did not have the opportunity to have that face-to-face, one-on-one with Jesus like the other 12 disciples. They all, you know, traveled with him. They saw Jesus do all the miracles, heard his sermons for three and a half years or with Jesus every day. Paul didn't have that opportunity, and so he's going to go out into the wilderness, and God is going to teach him out in the wilderness for three years in Arabia, he tells us, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's in near Mount Sinai in Arabia. That's where Moses was. That's where Elijah was, and, and I can imagine Saul of Tarsus went out there as well because he was in the desert of Arabia for most of that time in, in Arabia out in the wilderness. Um, that's where Jesus would give him some glorious revelations. He would teach him, you know, about communion. He would teach him, you know, so many things about what Paul wrote in the New Testament. And uh, the biggest thing was he'll, he'll tell us in Colossians that, uh, you know, this is the mystery of Christ. It's Jesus in us, the hope of glory. And, and so Jesus dwelling in us, working through us. And, and so even Peter had to admit about Paul, that the things that he received from Jesus were scripture. 
And you can look at it in 2 Peter 3.15. But let's quickly turn to Galatians. Turn your Bibles. It'll be on the screen also. But Galatians chapter 1. Um, and we'll read about what happened during those three years. in that, that gap there. Galatians 1. We'll look at verse 11. You got that? Yeah. He says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, we understood the gospel when Jesus saved him on the road to Damascus, but he'd get further details as he's spending time out in the wilderness. For you have heard, or, uh, yeah, verse 12. For I neither received it from man and taught it. Came, yeah, verse 13. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And then he says, And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father, speaking of the Old Testament way of doing things, and again, he was on his way to probably becoming the most important rabbi in Israel if he would have stayed on that so-called ladder, climbing his way up. Verse 15, But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb, wow, there's a good verse for the anti-abortion movement, right? God knows you. He created you even from your mother's womb. So God, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. And so it was again, grace. I hope we've been faithful enough over the years to teach you that God's grace is how you're saved. It's not through your own efforts. It's not through your own works. It's simply based on God's grace. He sent Jesus, the only, his only begotten son, to die on the cross for our sins, to rise from the dead, and the only thing we could do for salvation is believe, trust him for, for salvation. Verse 16, so he separated him from his mother's womb, called him through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and then returned to Damascus. And so here we see he goes out into the desert of Arabia, and it was there that Jesus would teach him the glorious truths we find in so many of Paul's letters. Verse 18, Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now concerning the things that I write to you, indeed, before God, I do not lie. Afterward, I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they were hearing only, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which we once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. And, and so here we see that in verse 18, that three-year gap that we look at in, in uh, Acts chapter 9. Um, the Apostle Paul was receiving the greatest seminary uh, of, of all time from Jesus himself. Now notice back in Acts 9.26, it says when Paul tried to join them uh, in Jerusalem, they, they didn't want to have anything to do with him. You know, they thought he was tricking them. They, they did not believe that he had been converted. And this is three years after his conversion. The believers were still afraid of him. They, they probably thought, well, this is a trick to try to infiltrate the, infiltrate the church, and then he's going to have us, the leaders like Peter and John and, and you know Thomas and the rest of the 12 that were still in Jerusalem. Oh, he's trying to infiltrate, and then he's going to get all of us in trouble and try to get us all killed. But they didn't trust him. Um, so look at verse 27, back here in Acts 9. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. This is the second mention of this guy named Barnabas. His real name was Joseph, but the apostles gave him the nickname Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. And he was certainly an encourager. He was always looking for opportunities to build up the body of Christ. 
He's always looking for opportunities to bless and strengthen the body of believers around him. And if he saw somebody in the, you know, his midst that was hurting, that was being ignored, that was being misunderstood, then he would lovingly do something about it. Uh, we'll see later on when the Apostle Paul is chewing out his nephew Mark <laughs> for bailing out on them. It'll be Barnabas that goes to Mark and tries to encourage him. And so we need more men and women like Barnabas, people who are willing to encourage others in the church, people who are willingly going to love and I guess lovingly stick their noses in other people's business. I mean, it, it's a good thing to do. Uh, it tells us in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. You can't do that from the sidelines. You got to be with people, be in other people's business, so to speak. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. And so much more as you see the day approaching. And so if we're truly walking in the Holy Spirit and not in the flesh, we would be men and women of encouragement. If you're constantly putting others down, constantly you know, getting on other brothers and sisters' cases, then you better check your walk with the Lord. You know, we would get our eyes off of ourselves and start looking for opportunities to be a blessing to others if we're walking in the Spirit. You know, a practical way is to say, hey, how you doing? Hey, can I take you out to lunch? Can I buy you coffee? I mean, just, you see somebody's really going through it, then reach out to him. Barnabas is walking in the Spirit, and he goes up to Paul. He reaches out to this guy that everybody's afraid of, this outcast, and he says, Paul, I know these apostles. These are good men. They love Jesus, so let me introduce you to them. Let me tell them how you've been radically saved. Let me, you know, kind of go before you and uh, tell them how you're boldly preaching Jesus, you know, to the, the Jewish people. And that's exactly what Barnabas does here in verse 27. Again, what a difference one person can make. Look at verse 28. So he was with them, so Saul, he's with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. Now again, from Galatians 1.18, we see that he stayed there in Jerusalem for 15 days, and he stayed with Peter. And I've always wondered, what would that have been like for Paul, Saul of Tarsus, to hang out with Peter for 15 days? I mean, their conversation must have been amazing. Because here's Peter, one of the 12. You know, he had been with Jesus for three and a half years. And I can imagine Saul just saying, Peter, what was he like, you know, to walk with him, to, to hang out? What did you guys talk about around the campfire? You know, what was it like to see him, you know, instantly heal somebody like lepers? All of a sudden their fingers pop back on, their noses are back in, you know, on their face. I mean, to see him, you know, what was it like to watch as he gave you that bread to distribute as he took the little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 men plus their families? It must have been mind-blowing, Peter. You know, what was it like when he raised people from the dead? What, the, how amazing is that? I'm sure they talked a lot about God's grace. A lot about the forgiveness they both found in Jesus. I'm sure Peter said, you know what, can you imagine Jesus forgave me after I denied him three times? And Paul saying, are you kidding me? After what I did to you guys, he forgave me? And, you know, Peter, I'm sure just reminded him, yeah, we had bad past, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us of all sin. We're new creations in Christ. So look at verse 29. So he's there for 15 days with Peter, and he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. So that's the third time in just this section that they want to kill Paul. Now, in a sense, Saul has come full circle here because he's witnessing to the Hellenists. Who are they? The Greek-speaking Jews there in Jerusalem. Paul was one of them. He was the Greek-speaking Jew in Jerusalem, he was with the Hellenists because it was the Hellenists that listened to Stephen. And then they took Stephen in chapter 7 and stoned him to death. And Saul was right there listening to everything Stephen said, heartily approving of his death. And now they want to kill him. The same Hellenists that he was supporting earlier now turn on him and want him dead. And so verse 30 
When the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him out to Tarsus. And so Tarsus is his hometown. Um, we're going to have a little break from Saul or the Apostle Paul till chapter 11, verse 25. And once again, it'll be Barnabas who will find him, track him down in Tarsus and bring him back to the church in Antioch. And then they will team up together. That'll be about a seven-year gap between now and when we see Saul of Tarsus again. But during those seven years, Paul kept growing in the Lord. Um, I'm sure a lot of those trials he went through that he talks about in 2 Corinthians 11, you know, the beatings and stonings and, well, not the stoning, but the shipwrecks and all these other things he went through that are not mentioned in Acts probably took place during that seven-year period. In other words, he was occupying until Jesus comes. Look at verse 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. This is a, a very important verse here. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. This is just a little summary verse that Dr. Luke drops in the text here. And in context, it really shows us the impact that Saul of Tarsus had on the church both before his conversion and then now after his conversion, because it tells us that all the churches in Israel, <clears throat> now they have peace. Now they're being built up. Now they're being multiplied. Now they have the fear of the Lord. They have the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, they had the fear of Saul. They were afraid. They, they were terrified of this man. And so here we see the impact, again, the salvation of one man. What a change it can make in people's lives. What a difference it can make when one person takes a relationship with Christ seriously. For all of us husbands, when we take our role as the head of the house seriously, and we do what God's called us to do, what a difference that can make in the house. If you have kids and you're taking that parental role seriously, what a difference that, and what an impact that can have in your family. And so the Holy Spirit will fill us and he'll strengthen us and he'll use us as vessels of honor in our homes. But without Christ, and if we start pushing him aside, as that foundation um, gets weakened and that's when turmoil comes in. That's when Satan tries to get a foothold in your home. And so we need to get serious about our relationship with Christ. We need to be the God-fearing uh, Christ-honoring, spirit-filled men and women that he has called us to be, men and women who love the Lord with all of our hearts, men who love and cherish their wives, wives who submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord. And so we need to be a good example to our children, grandchildren, to those around us of what God wants us to be. Um, some people think, well, that's just hard. You know, you don't know my spouse, it's impossible if we try to do it in the flesh, but we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Again, we're in a spiritual battle in all areas of our life, and nothing is impossible for God when we humble ourselves, we submit ourselves to Him, we, we, we start responding to His Word, and we let the Lord work in us. And so again, what a difference one person can make. Now, uh, we're going to move on from Paul, Saul, and we're going to start looking at Peter again. Uh, the rest of this chapter and into chapter 10. And, you know, if you remember, it was Jesus who gave Peter, he says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Not that he's up there in heaven, you know, I'll let people in or out. He's not the pearly gates letting people in or out. That's not what he does. When he says to Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, it was mean, I'm, let, I'm giving you the opportunity to open up the door of faith to the Jews first, that was on the day of Pentecost. He preaches the gospel, 3,000 get saved. And then to the Samaritans, we saw that in chapter 8, where he goes down, lays hands on them with John, and the Holy Spirit comes upon the Samaritans. And then the key of faith will be open to the Gentiles in chapter 10. Peter had that privilege of going to the Gentiles. And we'll see that you know beginning to happen here at the end of this chapter. But that's what it's all about, opening up the door, opening up that door. That's what the key represents. Peter is one of those guys that a lot of followers of Jesus love because we can identify him in so many ways. I mean, he was certainly blessed beyond measure, but at the same time, he made a lot of mistakes. Uh, he was far from perfect. Even after Pentecost, we see him stumbling and bumbling and making mistakes. 
He certainly experienced many highs in his life, and he had many lows as well, but he never gave up, and that's the key with Peter's life. He never threw in the towel and said, I can't do this. He would always get back into that right relationship with the Lord. This is what we read in, in John chapter 6, starting in verse 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve, and this is after many people are bailing on Jesus. He was speaking of hard things. Got to eat my flesh and drink my blood or you have no life in you. But he's speaking of his death, burial, resurrection. He's talking about spiritual things. Not You got to be a cannibal and eat my finger. He's not talking that way, even though there's a group out there that thinks he was literal. Anyway, he says to uh, the twelve, do you also want to go away like these other people? You want to bail? But Peter, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You, and that literally means you alone, have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so he's a great example of God taking, you know, flawed people and doing something great in their lives, people who are broken, people who have been messed up, and then God using them for his glory. Uh, this is a great quote. Uh, this one commentator said, it takes broken soil to produce a crop, a broken cloud to give rain, broken grain to produce bread, and broken bread to give strength, and God uses broken and failing people to reach a broken and failing world. End quote. Peter proves that failure never has to be the last word that defines our life. God's grace is bigger than any failing that we might have. So let's pick up in verse 32. The scene shifts here. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, and, uh, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. So we don't know if he had an accident or what happened to him, a disease, whatever it was, he's now paralyzed, bedridden for eight years. Can you imagine eight years just being in bed? Uh, I, uh, that'd be so frustrating. So discouraging. And he's that, that way for eight years. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, heals you. Arise, make your bed. Then he arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda, at Lydda and Sharon, saw him and turned to the Lord. You've heard of the Valley of, the, of Sharon, you know, the, the Rose of Sharon or Rose of Sharon. Uh, this is all around... Um, where the Tel Aviv airport is, actually, uh, was kind of built over where Lida presently is. But a couple of things to note here. Peter did not heal this man. Jesus healed this guy. Jesus the Messiah heals you. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so be careful to never glorify the instrument. But we always have to give the glory and the honor to Jesus. He alone is worthy. And it is the Lord who has done great things. Uh, this also proves to us that Jesus is very much alive. He's still touching lives. He's still healing broken bodies and broken hearts and broken lives and saving souls. And Peter tells him, Jesus the Messiah heals you. I mean, what an amazing miracle this is. I mean, he, he's healed instantly. And again, notice how one changed life has this tremendous impact. This is all the people there in Lydda. And in Sharon, they come to faith in Christ as a result of that one healing. Now, I can guarantee that Peter did much more than, you know, he wasn't, it was not just that he was used to heal Aeneas here. I'm sure he evangelized. I'm sure he discipled. I'm sure he fed the flock, as Jesus told him there in John 21. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. And he's faithful to do that wherever he goes. But isn't it awesome the way God can touch, again, one person and create this chain reaction where multitudes of people get touched by the Lord? We just saw that with Paul. We, now we're seeing it here with Peter. And that's why it's so important that we stay open to the Holy Spirit because he can bring one person into your life this week that you might minister to. They get saved, and who knows what they might turn into. They could turn into another Paul or Peter. 
um, I don't have the whole story in front of me, but when you look at, uh, there's a chain reaction that started with this shoe salesman that led D.L. Moody to the Lord. And so D.L. Moody gets saved by this just simple shoe salesman where he worked with him, and he gets saved. Down the road, D.L. Moody, I mean, he led thousands and thousands of people to Christ. And so one of the people that gets saved at D.L. Moody um, revival meeting, he ends up leading um, Billy Sunday to Christ. He was a famous evangelist. Down through the lineage of D.L. Uh, uh, Billy Sunday, one of those disciples leads Billy Graham to Christ, Billy Graham leads probably millions to the Lord. And how many people that have come to Christ like through Billy Graham? I mean, Skip Heitzig is one example. Many others that have come to faith just because of that one person was faithful to share. And you never hear about that one person. You hear about the famous people, so to speak, but it's always just being faithful, what God has entrusted to you, and then God brings the increase. So here, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. And he immediately rises up in all who dwelt in Lydda. Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Look at verse 36. At Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. This woman was full of good deeds and charitable, good works and charitable deeds, which she did. Now, if I was Tabitha's little brother, I would always go with Dorcas. I would be like, you're a dork. You know, mom, dork is getting, you know, whatever. I'd be such a brat when it comes to Dorcas. But both names mean gazelle. And so uh, you don't hear many Dorcases around. I've heard a few Tabithas out there, but not too many Dorcases. But the important thing to note is that she was a woman that says of good works and charitable deeds, which means she didn't just talk about ministry. She ministered. And that's important. Don't just talk about things, but do what God's called you to do. It's amazing how many people love to talk about ministry, but they want everybody else to do it. Well, the church should do this. The church should do that. And I'm always telling them, well, are you part of the church? If God's put it on your heart to do it, then do it. If it's of the Lord, we'll get behind it. If it's not of the Lord, we're not going to support it. But you have to do what God's called you to do. So anyway... Verse 37, but it happened in those days that she, Tabitha, became sick and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room. Now that is very, very unusual to lay somebody that had died, wrap them, well, I don't know if they wrapped them up, but they would wash the body and then to take them in the upper room and place them there. I mean, they're usually wrapping them up, getting them ready for burial because in that country, you didn't let them sit out too long because they would get ripe. And so to lay her in the room, this upper room, that's very unusual. And since Lida was near Joppa, again, she's in Joppa, Peter's in Lida, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. And so I'm wondering, you know, what are these disciples thinking Peter can do? I mean, they probably heard about Aeneas, because everybody in that region comes to the Lord. And so it's like, we got to get Peter here before she gets too ripe. Again, it's like 10 miles away. So it's not like, oh, catch a taxi and get over here in the next, you know, 20 minutes. You know, they'd have to hike there probably a day and another hike back with Peter. And so she's de dead and buried, in that, or not buried, but dead up in that upper room laying there. And so they sent two men imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. Then he had, when he had come, they brought him to the upper room. And all the windows stood, all the win windows, all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with them. Uh, somebody once said, she won the people of Joppa to Christ one garment at a time. So here's this godly woman who made things for the poor and needy, for the widows, and now she's dead. But they hear, Peter's only about 10 miles away. Let's go get him. Let's see what God can do. Uh, those of us that were in Israel last year, last March, um, you remember Joppa, because Joppa is about, I don't know, it's just right on the outskirts there of Tel Aviv, right there, beautiful place right on the Mediterranean. That's where um, Jonah, the prophet, tried to escape. He gets on a ship there in Joppa and 
tries to sail away, and God took care of that. But anyway, just a, a really neat place. Verse 40, but Peter put them all out. So they go to the upper room. There's all these mourners there. So Peter puts them out, knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. What an amazing scene this is. You know, he puts them all out of the room. Why do you think he puts them all out of the room? Because remember when Jairus' daughter had died, the centurion's daughter, he, she died, and then the woman with the issue of blood, you know, interrupts, touches his hem of his garment, and he starts dealing with this situation. And then in the meantime, some people come from uh, Jairus' house and said, nah, don't bother the teacher anymore, she's dead. And so I'm sure Jairus is like, oh, why the delay? And then Jesus, look at, cha uh, look at Mark. This is Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 35. He says, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, don't be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. So here's Peter, that inner circle, going with Jesus. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue. It wasn't this, okay, I got the wrong scene here. It wasn't the centurion's daughter. It was the ruler of the synagogue's daughter. And he saw tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. Can you imagine? Jesus said, nah, she's not dead. She's just asleep. Ah, you idiot. Well, who do you think you are? We know dead people. We mourn over dead people all the time. She's dead. He's, you know, no, no life in her. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, that's why Peter does this. He puts them all outside. He took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumai, which is translated little girl, I say to you, arise. What Peter says is Tabitha kumai, almost the same thing, Talitha kumai, and here he says Tabitha kumai. Little girl arise, immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years old, of, uh, 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. And so what an amazing thing. You know, you talk about imitating the master. That's why Peter does this. It's always good to imitate the master and the power of the Holy Spirit. This is how the Apostle Paul later would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. You know, not very many humans can say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. But that should be the goal because we're walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. So here in verse 41, then he gave her his hand and lifted her up when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed on the Lord. It's amazing. When Aeneas was saved or healed, all believed. Here, when she's raised from the dead, it says many believed, not everybody. There's always going to be skeptics. You know, even if Jesus raises somebody from the dead, even if Jesus himself raised from the dead, there's always people that are going to doubt. They're going to say, oh, I don't think that's true. And they'll try to come up with some excuse why it really didn't happen. But what a thrilling moment this must have been as Peter and Tabitha come out of that room. She's alive. There's rejoicing. What a glorious time. Now look at verse 43. We're going to end here. But this is a very pivotal point as well. So it was that he, Peter, stayed many days in Joppa, notice, with Simon the Tanner. Some of you, my age and older, know who George Hamilton is, the actor. He's known for his tanning. He used to do a commercial where he's, you know, he's there, and it was, I can't remember what the commercial was about, but he just says, toasty. <laughs> And he's, I mean, this guy's been tanning his whole life. It's amazing he's not just one ball of cancer. But be that as it may, that's not the kind of tanner we're looking at here. You know, he's not staying with this guy that's got a tanning bed. He's staying at a tanner who worked with dead animals, and they would make animal skins for various things, like wine jugs and other things. And so that was a place that is unclean, for a Jew to be around a tanner. They were considered unclean because they worked with all these dead animals. 
But God is using this to break down the barriers in Peter's life. Because Peter, who's been a very orthodox Jew his whole life, and now he's walking with Jesus, he leads his fellow Jews to Christ. That was good. That was easy. And then he leads a Samaritan. So these are half Jews, half Gentiles. He leads them to Christ. Okay, I can do that. And, and now he's preparing him for the dirty, rotten Gentiles because no respecting Jew would ever go to a Gentile. But he is being humbled. He's being broken down. He's being shown there's no place for prejudice in your heart. No self-righteous Jew would ever be associated with a tanner. And so, again, this shows us that when a person comes to Christ, the old prejudices must be done away with. There's no place in a Christian's life to say, I'm more important or I'm better than you, whoever that you is, based on color, based on background, based on economic status, based on anything. There, there can be no prejudice in our hearts. Jesus will, you know, tell Paul, Guess what, Paul? In Christ, there's neither Jew or Gentile, male or female, bond or free. We're all one in Jesus Christ. And that's a wonderful thing about the body of Christ. Not one of us in here is better than anybody else. We have different roles and responsibilities. It's the same when it comes to marriage. A husband is not better than the wife. He has different roles and responsibilities than the wife. The wife is not better than the husband, just has different roles and responsibility. We're on all on equal turf when it comes to Jesus. We're all on the same footing at the foot of the cross, you might say. Jesus has saved us equally. He loves us unconditionally, and he wants us to love others with that same love that he has put in our hearts. And that's why he would say in John 13, 33 through 35, the world's going to know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the new commandment he says I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Apart from Christ, we can't do it, but that's what he's doing with Peter, breaking down all those prejudices, going from the Jews, going to the Samaritans, going to um, this tanner, and then chapter 10 is the pivotal chapter when it comes to church history, because this is when the Gentiles will be invited in to the body of Christ. And it's amazing because this is almost 10 years later after Pentecost. It took them almost 10 years to finally say these Gentiles can get saved. And there's going to be some Jewish believers that are going to be even questioning that. Uh, it can't be that easy, Paul. They got to get circumcised according to the law of Moses. They got to keep the law. They got to become Jews first. Then they can become Christians. And Paul's going to shoot it down. Peter will actually shoot it down. The whole first church council in chapter 15 of Acts is another pivotal moment because if it went a different direction, if the vote went a different way, since it's voting season, then we would all be wearing little yarmulkes on our head, meeting on Saturday observing the feast days and all the holidays of the Jews, we would be um, holding fast to the Old Testament law and we would not understand what grace is all about. And that's why chapter 15 is so pivotal. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this amazing book of Acts. Um, how you take these simple fishermen like Peter and John and Andrew, James, the rest of the bunch, and tax collector like Matthew, and, and, and just these normal people, just like us, and yet you got a hold of their lives and you did tremendous things with them. Paul would say, many are called, few are chosen. The, the gospel is for everyone. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And so, Father, I pray that You would help us to see people through Your eyes, with Your love, with Your compassion, at the same time, not compromise, but speak the truth in love. And Lord, we just pray that you would use us to proclaim the good news to those around us. If we're not light and salt to those around us, then you'll use somebody else to step in. But Lord, thank you. 
And I thank you for my brothers and sisters that are here that are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They've experienced your hand upon their lives. And Lord, they've experienced your touch in their hearts. They know that they are not what they used to be. And Lord, we praise you and thank you that we're not what we're going to be because the day is coming when the dead in Christ will rise first. And we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with you in the clouds to meet you in the air. Thus, we will always be with the Lord. And you are going to change us in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And this body of corruption, this body of mortality will put on incorruption. We'll become immortal when we receive our resurrection bodies. And so, Lord, we know Whatever we go through in this life that's hard, that's difficult, it's going to be worth it when we see you face to face. And Lord, to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord, that's what we desire for everyone in here, for all that we lead to Christ, that they would walk in your strength and not in the weakness of the flesh. And so, Lord, help us to uh, be about the Father's business till you come for us and use us, Lord as instruments in your hands. And we give you all the glory, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.